Orgasmic Enlightenment, where the sexual and spiritual come together. I'm Kim Anami, and I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach and a vaginal weightlifter. In this show, we explore all things intimate. I believe that our sexual energy is life force, creative energy, and we can use it to shape our worlds, strengthen our relationships, and self-actualize. I blend the most avant-garde information from neuroscience, ancient sexual practices like Tantra and Taoism to renegade wellness modalities to show you how to create gourmet sex in your lives. Come one, come all. Natural birth equals ecstatic birth. The best birth expert in the world is you. Your body is your best expert. Today on the podcast, I have a supreme expert in pregnancy and birth, a woman. Yes, women are expert in these things. Their bodies are expert in these things. Yes, it so happens that this particular woman has birthed eight, yes, eight of her own babies, most of them at home and free birthed, meaning she has not enlisted any kind of outside so-called expert support such as a doctor or a midwife. She's had her partner, some close friends, her children, and maybe a few family pets as her birth attendants. And she also has 20 years experience facilitating the birth of other women's babies. But the main reason I'm calling her an expert is because by very nature of being a woman, she is one. Human females are the only species to be convinced that they cannot birth their own children without it being a major medical emergency. The truth is women's bodies are designed in a beautiful orchestra of hormones and and biofeedback to have blissful, orgasmic, self-actualizing birth experiences. What interferes with this is the typical hospital setting. And I've written about how the most dangerous place in the world to give birth is an American hospital. It's true. Statistically speaking, more babies and mothers die in the U.S. than in any other developed country in the world in hospitals. The whole topic is one I've become particularly impassioned about. It's obviously directly related to sexuality in that this is the outcome, (laughs) but there are many other parallels as well in the sense that women's true power and pleasure in these acts from sex to birth, and yes, I'm saying that ultimately nature designed birth to be as pleasurable and even more pleasurable than sex. (laughs) Yes, I'm saying that birth is supposed to be blissful and orgasmic, just the way that All women can have vaginal orgasms, G-spot orgasms, cervical orgasms. All women are capable of having blissful, empowering births, yet these powers have been removed from them. So in this episode, we'll talk about how to set the stage for the most optimal birth conditions, and I'll be doing several episodes on this in the coming weeks, and talking to women and having them share their stories of deeply pleasurable, transformational, all-natural births as nature intended. And I will preface all this information by saying that in no way am I blaming or shaming women for whatever birth experience they've had. I am absolutely blaming and shaming an allopathic OBGYN system, which discounts the instinctual power of a woman's body and manufactures birth emergencies simply to reinforce their own position of power and employment. (laughs) So I'm initiating these discussions because women and their partners need to know that there is a safe, gentle, pleasurable alternative to surgical technobirth. And this is a woman and her genetically encoded self that has been doing this for millennia, hundreds, thousands of millennia. Mother knows best. Today's guest is Yolanda Norris-Clark 
As I said, she is mother to eight children, all of which were home birthed and seven of which were free birthed, meaning that she cared for her body holistically throughout pregnancy and birthed at home with only her family and or non-medically trained friends present for emotional support. She came to recognize that she had a sacred mission to open this secret and to share the power of birth as the portal to one of the most profound experiences of awakening and planetary connection available to human beings, and also that birth itself is the foundation for peace. Peaceful babies, happy mothers, connected parenting, and healthy relationships and marriages. She's also supported hundreds of other women to choose the same path. First as a full-spectrum birth attendant, witnessing births throughout her community, and now as a birth coach and consultant, working with women and families all over the world. You can find her at freebirth.ca. Welcome, Yolanda. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hi, Kim. It's wonderful to be here. So let you are a great proponent of the whole natural birth, physiological birth process. You've had six children of your own. So not only does being a woman simply qualify you as an expert, but someone who's a definite um, regular uh, purveyor of the medium also. So why don't you walk us through what we know to be the absolute natural and inbred, encoded system of birth hormonally and how our bodies are meant to do this with our pure instinct. Right. Well, actually, Kim, I've given birth to eight babies. So close, but not quite. (laughs) So I have six little ones at home right now. My two older ones are big. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite the pro. And really, I call myself a pro because I've just had a lot of babies and I've witnessed many births, but um, my expertise really lies in my understanding of the process as a mother. Um, and birth is just so amazing. And as you say, um, you know, we're animals and like every mammal, human beings are hardwired not only to give birth spontaneously, but really to be imprinted by the process of instinctive birth itself, which when undisturbed, really lays the physiological foundation for love and attachment and really easeful mothering. And when the complex, intricate structure of hormonal and chemical reactions that take place during birth is disrupted or disturbed, this can really compromise the safety of both the mother and the baby. And this can really have an enormous effect on the lives of that mother-baby unit because we are a unit, so mothers and babies together. So this can affect their attachment, it can affect breastfeeding, you know, how the mother feels after her birth, and just generally the postpartum experience, which lasts a lifetime, right? And her you know, entire instinctive experience of motherhood as a whole. So birth really does matter to me, anyway. <laughs> So can you walk us through the physiological process? So what's the difference then in terms of how we're meant to birth naturally and let this process kick in versus when women step into, let's say, a hospital setting and what impact that can have on this natural flow and process? Right. So as I said physiological birth process is very complex and it involves this amazing kind of interweaving of of hormonal reactions, kind of a chain reaction, if you will. And um, when we, so when we disrupt the birth process in any way, this can have a major effect. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that disruptions of any kind can impact on the hormonal flow, which is really so important. So even from the very first step outside of our sphere of of home and safety, um, the hormones of birth require certain um, a a certain context in order for, for that to function properly. So um, 
let's take oxytocin, for example. So oxytocin is the hormone of love. It's released during hug. It spikes during orgasm. Um, but the very highest peak level of oxytocin that's ever emitted during anyone's lifetime occurs during the birth process and immediately postpartum. Now, during that birth process, the body's production of oxytocin is really dependent on certain factors, and they're primarily environmental. So if the mother experiences fear, for example, um, uh, or the presence of strangers or bright lights or anything that can trigger adrenaline at the wrong time, her cortisol levels will rise, and this in turn will diminish her body's ability to produce oxytocin. And this can cause her birth process to stall or to stop. Um, and this is something that we see happen all the time in the hospital. So a mother can be at home and she's you know, experiencing the first sensations of birth and everything seems to be going really well. And then, you know, she decides or someone in her vicinity decides that it's time to go to the hospital because it seems like the baby's coming. Um, and then she leaves her home and gets into her car and all of a sudden everything can stop. And, you know, this is seen as a big problem in the hospital. So this is one of the reasons why such a huge proportion of births are augmented with synthetic oxytocin. But rather than a problem, this is actually a brilliant adaptation because giving birth when we feel fear, if we're being chased or if we're being harassed or abused or if we have to have, you know, conversations with people, um, this is really maladaptive. It doesn't, it doesn't really work. So, um, so just stepping outside of our homes is really the first intervention. And that, again, can cause a cascade of negative uh, reactions and, and uh, responses in the body that can really inhibit that essential flow of hormones that leads a woman from one stage of birth to the next and really ensures the safety of the process. So I think one of the problems in our culture is that birth practitioners who work within the system have the best of intentions, but I think often they don't really even understand what a physiological birth even looks like. And so it's impossible to really protect that framework if we don't have a solid understanding of what it is and how it works. So oxytocin is just one example, but there are so many hormones that work together to create a safe and smooth and spontaneous birth. And any disruption from leaving one's home to having to kind of pop out of that uh, sort of ancient lizard brain that, again, is conducive to allowing that flow of hormones to work can inhibit the entire structure of birth. And I think that's one of the big reasons why we're in the situation we're in. Right. And it's just, it's kind of ironic that the more safe place where we can allow that birth to take place is in the home, as you're saying, where oxytocin is nurtured where like having that space of being able to open and to trust and to relax is most going to be available in a safe environment and i've often used this analogy when i'm talking about this is like when you say like people can relate to having a dog or a cat you know as a pet right and when they're pregnant and they're going to give birth they don't climb up onto the kitchen table and ask to be strapped down and a bunch of bright lights shone on top of them that would that would freak the, the animal out to no end and probably stop the entire birth process. Instead, the animal looks instinctively for some kind of dark private space, maybe in a closet, under a bed, under your deck, and gives birth there by itself undisturbed, right? In this quiet place where it can literally go inside of itself and tune into the process and allow its body to do what it's meant to do. And you, I'm going to pull from some of your Instagram quotes, your pithy Instagram truisms here, and one of the ones I really like is birth does not require that we trust our bodies, just that we surrender. And so I'm going to let you unpack that a bit. But I mean, the way that I interpret that is we just have to be open to the wisdom that's already there. And we are living in a time where we are 
conditioned away from our natural instincts in so many ways. And there's this entire message through the obstetric community and practice you know, that I rail against all the time in my work, which is that women can't do these things. They can't have normal periods. They can't have normal births. They can't have normal or pleasurable menopause. And we can help you. We can give you pills for that. We can give you surgeries for that. But your body is pretty fucked up, apparently, and isn't able to do these things on its own. And that's why I push back against that community so much and that idea so much, because I've got but decades of experience and thousands of women and thousands of vaginas that show us otherwise, you know, if not hundreds of thousands at this point of people who've had success by learning how to tune into the wisdom and the power of their own bodies and not having to be reliant on an outside source for answers. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I have experienced a, a similar phenomenon in my work. I've been in the birth world for you know, almost 20 years now, and I've been witnessing births for, you know, about a decade um, regularly. And uh, I just know that women can give birth. And uh, it's funny that you that you referenced um, um, the quote that I shared on Instagram, because I have given birth to eight babies, as I said, and I don't trust the process. I mean, I, I do, but I also, I, I do in a way, but in those moments of um, intensity, uh, I experienced just as much fear um, and sometimes terror, but also you know, euphoria. There's just, birth is everything, right? But, but uh, I wouldn't say that I am especially trusting of the process. I mean, it, it scares me too. It's such an otherworldly and yet so grounded and rooted experience. And you know, I think when you talk about, about the way the system works, um, you know, I think if industrial birth practitioners didn't disrupt and sabotage birth from the very beginning, it would really be difficult for them to receive compliance for the procedures that they're, you know, mandated to enact on women and babies, especially after the birth, right? I mean, if a woman who's had an undisturbed birth would, you know, we would kill anyone who tried to come and, you know, take our babies. Like that is what is also encoded and hardwired into our bodies as mammals. Um, uh, you know, I remember my first birth that was a very long and difficult birth, but also very ecstatic. Um, and I'd given birth and, you know, I held my baby during that golden hour immediately postpartum, but then I had to go pee. So I gave my baby to my partner to hold and I kind of hobbled to the bathroom and I sat down on the toilet and I was suddenly flooded with adrenaline and fear and rage. And I burst into tears and I immediately demanded my baby. And of course, my partner complied. He brought my baby to me right away. Um, and I grabbed him and I was panting and I put him to my breast and then I peed and it was fine. But, you know, I, in that moment, I would have killed someone literally had my baby not been immediately brought to me. So again, you know, all of these, we're, we're designed to be able to give birth and then we're designed to be able to mother our babies after the fact. Um, and I think we have to get away from, as you said, this idea of having a really intellectual understanding of birth. I mean, that can help, I think, considering the situation we're in because we are fed so many myths about what birth is like. Um, but ultimately, we give birth with our biology and not our intellect, right? So, um, so this idea of like, well, trusting birth, we have to trust birth, not really. Uh, we really do just have to surrender and we can still experience fear and you know, have a great, wonderful, safe, birth. Um, but when the process is modified to the extent that it is within these systems that we've established um, in our culture, um, birth just can't work as well. You know, that's just so let's, how, let's how dive it is. into. Uh, yeah. So let's dive into more of the hormonal process there. So with 
when oxytocin, natural oxytocin in the woman is allowed to flow and do its job, it creates feelings of, you said, you know, like the, the most, the highest level of oxytocin ever. And this comes out of the work of Dr. Sarah Buckley, who's really researched the physiological um, imprinting behind all of this comes at birth. It's like, I like what she said, like a 50 or a hundred times more than orgasm. It's if, if allowed to go undisturbed. So the kinds of orgasms I'm often talking to women about are vaginal orgasms, G-spot orgasms, cervical orgasms. And if you look at the cervix, well, birth is going to be the largest orgasm potentially of a woman's entire life. And I love that there's this awareness now of this parallel. And that that birth was intended to be this way. And so when oxytocin is allowed to flow, that's where we can actually generate these feelings of bliss and ecstasy and transcendence and openness. You know, the cervix being this portal between life and death. And so I'll talk, we'll talk more in a moment about the whole spiritual experience for women that's available to them of rebirth and transformation, rebirthing themselves. But let's first go into this hormonal flow. So when that's allowed to happen, how the oxytocin then generates pain relief, natural pain relief. And the problem with cutting off the oxytocin and then say supplementing it with synthetic pitocin um, is that it actually generates more pain for the woman. And so this entire natural process that's meant to shield and protect and guide a woman through the entire birth is now interrupted. And so that then facilitates this dependence on these outer measures because the woman's natural process is now sabotaged, as you say. And so the woman thinks that now, okay, I had to do all these things because my body just stopped. Yes, your body stopped because it was being shut down, you know, from the outside. And so, or from, you know, the, the outside environment was, pre was preventing this proper flow of oxytocin that's really the ringleader, is really the guide and the director of the entire birth process if left undisturbed. That's right, yeah, and I think we really um, underestimate the degree to which these small um, interferences, rather than, you know, there's, there's sort of, I make the distinction between interventions, which are you know, very clear and direct, and we, you know, we know what those are, you know, it's like... Uh, well, what are well, they, just for our audience, like what would we consider to be interventions? Right, so when a woman arrives at the hospital, you know, there's a certain process that that, that starts to, to take place. So um, often she'll have a vaginal exam, right? Um, that's an intervention because that's not a normal thing. You know, it's not normal to have, I say normal, but um, it's become normal. Um, it's very invasive when you're trying to have a baby to have strangers putting their hands inside your vagina. And this is rationalized in the system as a necessity. Um, you know, we need to check your cervix. We have to, you know, be able to determine how dilated your cervix is. And this is a really huge misconception because it actually doesn't really give us very much information. Having someone put their hands inside our vaginas to uh, determine how many centimeters supposedly our cervix is dilated, um, that, that, that doesn't tell us anything about what is going to happen in the next 10 minutes or the next 10 hours. So, a woman's cervix can be uh, two centimeters dilated one moment, and she can be fully dilated then in 30 minutes. A woman can a woman's cervix can sit at five centimeters dilated for three weeks before she ends up giving birth. So, um, you know, having someone put their hands in, in her vagina is it's really an arbitrary thing, but it's been become so enmeshed in the system that it's it's just it's a given, you know, we, we, we've, we've been enculturated to expect this, but you know, that's going to have I'll a huge impact on, sorry, just that it's also yeah. then this symbolic way of giving away power, right? Immediately you're like to sit down, open your legs, have a stranger or a number of strangers examine you and tell you <laughs> where you're at, right? And so this is this immediate secession of power. Oh no, 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 you have the power. I don't have the power. Of course, of course. This is a way to groom a woman when she enters the hospital into submission because the entire um, the, the game of industrial birth is submission, right? So that 
initial um, violation of her body when she first enters the hospital kind of sets the tone for what she can expect. And it's humiliating <laughs> to have a stranger put their hands inside your vagina. I mean, this is our most private place, especially during the birth process when our bodies are supposed to be flooded with the hormone of love, oxytocin. It's, it, it really is a very, um, very detrimental um, kind of experience. And, you know, it's interesting because it's, like, it's, it's designed, you know, to, to, to be a certain way. Um, it's, it's very purposeful, right? As you said, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's designed to, to take a woman's power so that she will then feel comfortable or not feel comfortable, but, but come to expect that kind of process of submission. So, um, and, and, you know, that has an effect on our psyche. It has effect, an effect on our emotional state. And it also, in turn, has an effect on our body. So I think we're still functioning under this notion that there's this sort of duality, right? Like there's mind and body. And you know, we know that they're one. And so anything that happens like that to a woman when she enters the hospital, um, that has a physiological um, result as well. So, um, you know, you mentioned, uh, so, so yeah, so that's kind of one of the first things that can happen. That's going to, um, you know, maybe cause her to have some fear. And so if she's feeling scared above and beyond what, you know, what the intensity of birth itself will produce, then that's going to unbalance her hormones. It's going to um, impede the flow of oxytocin. Um, it's going to raise her cortisol levels. Cortisol will tamp down the production of oxytocin as well. Um, and that's often when, oh, gee, well, her birth process has kind of started to stall. Um, you know, gee, what are we going to do about that? So, of course, that's often when, um, you know, a birth process is augmented. That's one of the nice kind of euph euphemisms that, mm -hmm. um, that are used in the hospital system. And, um, you know, as you know, Kim, synthetic oxytocin, Pitocin, behaves very differently in the body than does natural oxytocin. So synthetic oxytocin does not pass the blood-brain barrier, um, and it actually inhibits the body's natural production of oxytocin. Um, so essentially, when we're, um, receive, we're on a pit drip, the Pitocin drip, um, the body gets the message that, oh, okay, we don't need any more of that stuff. So, you know, let's shut it off, right? Um, and researchers like uh, obstetrician Michel Audin, who is a, a French uh, doctor, um, he hypothesizes that the shutdown of natural oxytocin production actually affects the way mothers relate to our infants after birth because um, the, the spike um, in oxytocin happens at the moment of birth, but also actually right after the baby is born. Um, and that's what helps the placenta to um, shear away from the side of the uterus safely and, um, and emerge. And at the same time, that's when the mother is designed, um, programmed to look at her baby and smell her baby and fall in love with her baby. So that's really the peak level of oxytocin and comes right and during, during the emergence of the baby and right after. And so if a woman is on Pitocin and her natural oxytocin production is shut down, her brain is not receiving those same signals. And, you know, I've had heartbreaking conversations with women who have told me that, um, well, oxytocin, uh, synthetic oxytocin is also injected into a woman's body um, ostensibly to halt postpartum bleeding or to prophylactically prevent excessive postpartum bleeding. Now, that's another topic altogether. I don't want to get too into that. But, um, you know, I've had conversations with mothers who have given birth to their babies and in the hospital and felt that flood of love for their babies. And then they've experienced the um, synthetic oxytocin injection. And they've immediately kind of felt a distance from their infants and that they no longer kind of feel connected. Um, and, you know, Odin is, is hypothesizing that we may be looking at um, a generation of people whose hormonal love receptors are actually damaged. And, you know, you look at 
the state of the world at times on certain mm -hmm. days. And I think it, like that ma makes some sense, right? Um, so I think that, again, we're functioning under this, um, this notion that all of these modifications that we do to birth are, you know, not that big a deal. And, you know, women, especially in our free birth community, I mean, we hear from women all the time who are told that, you know, the choices that they make are, are kind of selfish and, you know, arbitrary and like, don't you want a healthy baby? But we don't seem to understand on a wider cultural level that these modifications that we're making to birth actually may be having a very, very significant effect, not only on individual relationships, um, you know, re relationships between mothers and their babies, but obviously we carry those effects into our adulthood and this impacts on our ability to relate to each other as adults, but also on a wider cultural level. Um, I think it's changed society and uh, that's something to, to really think about for sure. Absolutely. I think there are far reaching effects with that. Let's return back to that process because there's another piece to this that I want to address. And so with that natural flood of oxytocin in the body that also facilitates breastfeeding. And so this is what a woman is meant to do after she has a baby is to connect and nurture her baby, both energetically and physiologically with breast milk, which has massive, massive immune seeding qualities. And so not just nourishment, you know, for food, but it's like populating her, the, the microbiome of the infant. So it's massively important. And so when this oxytocin process has been interrupted, women can often experience difficulty with letdown or with breastfeeding afterward because this is a massive part of the flow, the hormonal flow that goes from one stage to another stage. And so women can think that, oh, and again, this becomes this rationalization. Like I hear this similar rationalization so much in my work sexually, like, oh, you're just one of those women who doesn't know how to orgasm or can't orgasm. Don't worry about it. It's okay. And that very similar pat on the head is given to women in terms of breastfeeding. Oh, and because there's a very convenient, um, paid for alternative, which is formula, which isn't really an alternative to breast milk, but it's a whole other topic. But um, the, this interference then prevents that response. And then it can be rationalized with, oh, it's okay. You're just, you know, you're just one of those women who can't do it. Well, if, I mean, I don't know what the percentage is exactly, but I mean, if like this many women can't do it, we have a real problem with the species, you know, but anyway, but we know the source of that problem is most likely, uh, you know, 90, nine percent of the time that they were interfered with in that process and so that pre prevents the real production of their milk flow absolutely so when the oxytocin system is disrupted you know again that's the hormone of love that's what kind of um you know initiates that sense of um, euphoric adoration for our babies and if that's not there like there's not much there's there's less of an impetus to pick our babies up and nurture them immediately. And you know, this is a complicated issue because there are so many factors that are involved, but what I see in birth and what I've experienced myself is that um, when I give birth to my babies, um, there's just no question that I would bring them to my breast. Like it is, it is completely instinctive. Um, and we see in the hospital as well, not only is the flow of oxytocin disrupted, but, you know, babies are removed from their mothers. And, um, and again, there's so much that happens prior to that that kind of facilitates the, um, it kind of sets the stage for the woman to submit to that. So, you know, all of these little interventions, all of the interferences, um, uh, have have this effect of 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 damaging their hormonal system and you know prolactin which is the hormone that facilitates um, breastfeeding and that causes letdown um, it doesn't just uh, it's not just about breastfeeding what what's so fascinating about that hormone in particular is that it actually uh, allows women to 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 tolerate um, 
monotony. And that sounds kind of like a downer, but actually what it is is that, you know, mothering involves these repetitious activities, right? You know, you're just like mothers are constantly nursing their babies through the first you know few months of, of a baby's life. And um, breastfeeding allows that process of constant nurturing to actually be pleasurable. And of course, during a breastfeeding uh, session, mothers are also producing oxytocin as well. So all of these systems are completely intermingled and each is dependent on the other. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it really makes sense that if birth is disrupted, then all of the other kind of attendant mothering um, tasks and experiences, there's going to be a disruption there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, humans are so incredible. You know, unlike animals, we, we don't just function off of instinct, right? Like we have intellect and consideration and this whole sort of cerebral conception of things. So unlike animals, we don't just love our children instinctively. We also choose to love them. And, you know, that's an incredibly powerful force. So for every woman who becomes enraged by the idea that, you know, for example, her surgical birth might have had an effect on her baby or on her or her experience of mothering, you know, there are like six other women who will message me privately and say that, you know, they deeply adore their child, uh, but it took them a week or a month to really feel that visceral love. And, you know, breastfeeding was really, really hard. And their recovery from surgery made things really difficult on their relationships. Sex is not the same and on and on and on. And so, you know, I don't think we really recognize um, just how profoundly the experience of birth really affects every aspect of our lives as women, not just as mothers, but every single aspect of our lives. And, you know, women, I think, know that something is missing. And, and, and this also points to how profound our instinct really is as well, because there are so many women who feel that sense of loss, um, even if it's not quite conscious and even if they can't quite articulate it. Um, yeah, and, you know, there's no standard experience of birth, um, but, you know, in 20 years, working with women and being in the birth world, um, it's really my knowing that the way we do birth has an effect. And, you know, we can't ever be sure what that effect will be on our lives. Um, different women have different experiences, but we can make some really dependable assumptions about how our choices are going to impact on, on our lives when it comes to birth. And, you know, the choices we make can really optimize, not ensure or guarantee, but optimize the chances of certain outcomes. So if we want a, a vital um, and healthy experience of breastfeeding, then we need to be looking at what's happening during our birth process that can either support that um, you know, goal or undermine it. And that even extends into the afterbirth experience where the ideal and I think the unimpeded hormonal directive would be that the woman feels a sense of euphoria and bliss and, you know, wonderment and pleasure. Like she's really had this spiritual portal that she's gone through and that the opposite of that is when women have postpartum depression. And here's, this is a great quote from you where you say terms like postpartum depression and the baby blues serve to normalize the PTSD that women experience after giving birth. Earth, obfuscating the fact that it's obstetric violence and an absence of loving, compassionate support that causes depression after childbirth and the motherhood, not motherhood or the birth process itself. And I would agree with that is that that wasn't, that isn't normal, but it's become normalized and it's become normalized because it's so many women's experiences that they have these very interfered with births. So it becomes normal to go to the hospital, to have these exams, to have Pitocin, to have an epidural to have a C-section. We have a C-section rate in the U.S. of 33%. In some hospitals, it's 50 to 80%. And so that becomes a normal experience. And statistically, it's borne out that women who have these experiences do have higher rates of postpartum depression. And of course they do, you know? And so I'd say both from the kind of 
shock of what they've gone through and that their body simply wasn't allowed to go through the process it was designed to. And so it's trying to put the pieces back together. I'd say both the woman spiritually, energetically, emotionally, psychologically, but even physiologically, it's trying to re configure itself when, you know, it's very instincts and millennia worth of experience has just been shunted to the side and it's trying to figure out how to put the pieces back together. Absolutely. I mean, our nature as human beings is, it's love, right? So, you know, when you look at these epidemic rates of, of surgical birth or birth by knife, as um, midwife Sister Morningstar refers to C-sections. I just spent a weekend with her, and she's lovely. Um, uh, and it's sort of epidemic rates of you know, mothers and babies, or mother babies as a unit that are you know, drugged during birth, epidemic rates of babies who go you know, without a complete relationship with their mothers through breastfeeding. And then we look at you know, these rates of postpartum depression, and then further on in life, I don't know, you know, porn addiction, addiction in general, sexual dysfunction, whatever, um, all of it really makes a lot of sense to me. And I don't, you know, I'm not drawing a direct causation between any one thing and another. There are, again, so many factors to this. Um, but it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a relationship. I mean, I just, I see it all the time. And uh, it's, it's really it's really everywhere. And, um, you know, I've had the enormous and, and really radical experience of having done a lot of kind of rewilding of myself through, through birth. Um, and I think I have, um, you know, a kind of a, a relatively unique knowing. Um, and I think understanding and knowing is, is kind of a different thing. You know, like when I, when I scream my babies into the world and I you know, pick them up from between my thighs, covered in blood and meconium, and I and lift them to my heart, like like the animal that I am, and my body is just flooded with rapture and and bliss beyond any post orgasm that I've ever experienced. And then my baby's nurse, and we spend the next six months in interdependent love, you know, needing each other and feeding each other so so easily, still riding that birth high. Um, you know, despite, in my experience as well, you know, despite a lack of support that I think is real for all of us to, to a degree, because I'm in the world, you know, I lead a slightly fractured existence like everyone, um, you know, it still tells me something really powerful. And I hear that from other women too. You know, I see, I've been, I've been watching this for 20 years, that I can see a general distinction between uh, the experience of mothering for women who have had that relatively undisturbed kind of birth experience that really isn't possible to experience in an industrial setting. Um, I think it really does make a difference. And the whole term um, postpartum depression uh, really bothers me because um, it's like this very specific form of depression is uh, assumed to be just simply a normal outcome of the birth process. And it's not. Birth is supposed to be ecstatic. Um, it really is. It's supposed to be blissful. It's supposed to, uh, you know, make us want to have more babies. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, mothering is supposed to be pleasurable. Um, and it can be. And that's not to say that it always is, even for women who've had spontaneous births. You know, I get into a lot of trouble because, you know, I make these grand <laughs> pronouncements about birth that are, that are absolutely true for me. But I completely understand that there's a variety of experiences. But I think what it is is that, you know, um, again, there are so many variables and women aren't supported um, in birth and postpartum. So, I mean, it's a tricky thing for sure. But, but in general, um, again, we're animals and you look at the animal world and birth and mothering are not supposed to be these terrifyingly punishing experiences that leave us feeling destroyed. It's just not supposed to be like that. And it doesn't have to be like that. 
Right. And it makes sense that if women have that imprinting through the birth experience, that that's going to carry over into their experience of motherhood. And that rather than having a their instincts kick in and this natural intuition of how to mother. And, you know, what I've heard from many women who've, mother, who've birthed naturally is that they have a certain kind of fierceness and protectiveness and energy that's born in them through the process. Because of course, like you say, if someone was to be a threat to your child, you would have this natural response to kill, you know, literally to kill. And because that's what we would have had to have. That's what animals have. That's completely natural. Like you hear, oh, you know, it's fine if you see a bear in the forest, but if they've got cubs, you know, then that's when you're most likely to be attacked, right? Just out of the blue, because they're going to be in this ultra protective mode. And I love, this is another statement. You're quite poetic in your statements here, but here's another one I really like, which is we can anesthetize the exquisite and excruciating primal sensations of birth in the short term, but the somatic experience will be etched on our cells and in our psyches one way or another, now or later, either as a loss or a wound or as ecstasy. Nature always acquires its balance and biology will not be repressed. And so this is what I think most women aren't aware of because it's really just not in the cultural narr narrative at all, is that birth is this massive, spiritual, self-actualizing, transformative experience for the woman. And it's a, it's a huge tool, you know, and I've written about this in my work that certain portals like menstruation and menopause, anything that can, that's related to opening of the cervix and birth are these extremely potent experiences. And historically, in ancient cultures, and civilizations like they looked at these times that's what women were considered to be the shamans naturally because they had this access to other dimensions through the opening of the cervix this gateway between the other worlds between life and death and men had to go and do vision quests and drugs and <laughs> these like circles because they didn't have it they didn't have it women were actually considered to be the spiritually superior being and i'm not trying to put men down. I'm just trying to create a little, you know, men have their power as well, but I'm just trying to rebalance some of the power that's been removed from women. And so instead we see that these women, the times in a woman's life are denigrated, right? Menopause, women have to take hormones now. They're all dried up. Periods are terrible, debilitating, depressing, suicide inducing times. Birth is painful, excruciating, surgical. You know, we've had the exact opposite now in our modern culture. And the thing that I think pains me the most, like I said, is that women now have no clue that this was actually meant to be this self-directing, self-actualizing experience that's truly one of the peaks of a woman's life or the, you know, in the time of being a, in a female body and that all of that has been removed. And if you try to suggest that, then you get the finger pointed back at you like, oh, you're blaming women, you're shaming women. No, not at all. Mate, like, let me be a thousand percent clear that who I'm blaming and shaming is the allopathic obstetric profession, not women themselves. Women are just trying to do their best listen to the so-called experts who have become very much off course. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the allopathic uh, medical system, industrial birth system, it is in part designed to uh, diminish women's power because imagine if we were powerful imagine if we felt powerful postpartum and we felt to like just just perfectly connected to our babies and we found mothering to be easeful we wouldn't need to i mean rushing off to the doctor for this that and the other you know buying all these plastic gadgets to put our babies into because you know they're it just the whole system kind of works together and um you know i think that um birth is always ecstatic so no matter no matter what kind of birth we have because if you think about the etymology of the word ecstasy um it comes from uh, well, there are there are different different etymologies, but one of the most powerful powerful one is is from the Greek, um, the ancient Greek, and that is ecstasis, and that means um, displacement or 
you know, finding ourselves outside of ourselves, outside of what is known, outside of what, you know, that which is firm and, and solid. It's kind of removal of ourselves from the physical realm, right? Um, and that has to happen during birth, whether you're giving birth at home or you're having a free birth, or you're having, you know, birthing in the hospital. Um, but the difference is that during an industrial birth, what tends to happen is that because the woman's own hormonal system that again is designed to create this hallucinatory, you know, uh, I think spiritual experience, absolutely. Um, because the hormonal system is so disrupted by everything that's happening around her, you know, strangers, nurses, doctors, um, you know, the system is designed to modify and co-op the birth process. The woman then has to find that ecstasy, that transformation, you know, that trance-like displacement from, from the now, from an external source. So that's the epidural, that's the opiate drugs that, that, that she then reaches for, because giving birth in such a, um, uh, just such a, a foreign and, and terrifying environment um, is, it's, 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 un, it's, it's unbearable, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, ecstasy is part of it, part of it no matter what, but the spiritual experience of giving birth physiologically is, is utterly transformative. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and I am so, so grateful to be a woman. I mean, our bodies are absolutely amazing. They're, they are, they are magical. And I'm sure, you know, Kim, in the work that you do, um, you know, when you mentioned the importance of, of, of our cervixes and, and, and how our bodies work, um, uh, there are certain uh, gynecological procedures now, um, the LEAP procedure in particular, like uh, where, where a, a chunk of a woman's cervix is removed, um, just now discovering that this actually has a massive effect on a woman's sexuality. This can um, impede her ability to even have an orgasm. So all of these procedures, you know, we're really just, we don't, we don't understand how women's bodies work at all. You know, gyneco gynecologists think they have it all figured out. Um, but but our, our, our bodies are so brilliant. Um, you know, another example is um, that we're just now starting to maybe wonder if our uteruses are in direct communication with our brains and that our uteruses have an impact on our, our memory. So we're finding that women who have hysterectomies now are, are perhaps more prone to you know, memory loss and um, wow. cognitive issues. So yeah, all of these systems are so, so interconnected. So when you think about a woman who is in the birth process and she goes into the hospital or, or just prior to her birth process, this is another intervention that's become completely standardized. It's called the cervical sweep. So that's when a practitioner will put their fingers inside a woman's vagina and reach up into her cervix and, <clears throat> and scrape the um, kind of connective tissue that sort of adheres um, the, the mother's um, bag of waters, the, the baby's bag of waters to the cervix. And they'll scrape around that um, kind of membrane uh, in hopes that that kind of irritation will prompt the birth process. So this is another issue, you know, we have Ugh, these epidemic rates of induction. Oh, isn't it disgusting? I mean, there's a reason why our babies are protected the way they are. Like there's, so, I mean, this procedure, this cervical sweep has no basis in, in science. It's not evidence-based like so many of these procedures. I mean, um, you know, the industrial obstetric system, they love to talk about, you know, evidence-based practice and you know informed consent and all that stuff and just so much of what they do actually has no basis whatsoever in science and this is one of the big ones um but when you realize that our sexuality is i mean it, we we know this right like our 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 yonis our cervixes that that's all part of our our sexual um system and and sexuality and spirituality, I mean, all of this stuff is so interconnected. And I just, it, it, what are we doing? It's absolute 
madness. Um, and another thing too, when we're talking about oxytocin as well, um, it's those, uh, uh, it's actually stretch receptors um, in our lower, lower vagina and our lower yoni that trigger a, a spike in oxytocin as our babies are descending. Um, as our babies are being born. And so it's the baby's head pushing on that part of our body as our baby's heads emerge that creates another spike in oxytocin. So when you think about um, an epidural, it numbs a woman from the waist down. So that's another aspect of, of the system that, that kind of um, you know really erodes that natural sort of biofeedback that again sets the stage for for our mothering journey. Um, anyway, I'm just rambling now. But all no, of no, no, stuff no. It's so all related, and you know, this is I think the phrase or word you just use, biofeedback, is that that's. Mm -hmm. And that's really the whole birth process is this constant biofeedback, you know? And so that's why if we really surrender to it, why women can have painless, ecstatic, pleasurable birth experiences when they truly open to that. And when I coach women and how to get to cervical orgasms, it's really <laughs> very much the same process of opening and surrendering and letting go and allowing for this portal to open. And that can be scary, right? This is like a spiritual jumping off place into the abyss and if a woman is afraid if she's really feeling like she wants to be mentally in control and like it's a, the same thing that I hear over and over again from women who can't get to these orgasms yet is that they have a hard time letting go of control you know that would be the number one thing that is preventing them from accessing these places and so if you have that which obviously like that's part of the process that's the kind of going through the ring of fire that women have to go through to get there whether it's a cervical orgasm or a natural birth and so that's the real prep work in my mind is this energetic spiritual prep of leaping off into the ethers you know like this this jumping off point rather than you know getting ultrasounds and getting cervical checks and you know position checks you know like one of my Another phrase that you've used that I really like is your baby's posi positioning is not a pathology. And it, like this idea that, oh, the baby needs to be in this optimal position and there's this obsession with this and with the length of labor and due dates in birth. And so, again, it's like this antitrust of the whole procedure, the whole process is reinforced every step of the way, right? That you can't trust these things, that the body doesn't know what to do. And so if a woman's coming up against that, there's a, I mean, understandably, there's a lot of information that she's being bombarded with of all the ways in which she could fuck up this pregnancy and this birth. And if she doesn't do these things, she's going to end up with a severely, either a dead baby, I guess, or a damaged baby. And another thing you say as well that I really like is, is a healthy, is not having, how do you say it? Is not having a dead baby doesn't mean that you have a healthy baby or, you know, it's like, it's not one, they're not one in the same just because your baby's alive. And that's often the rationale. Oh, you had this horrific experience, but oh, your baby's alive. Like, okay, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily healthy, you know, that it's gone through all of these things, that its process and, and the mother's process has been severely disrupted. And so, sure, it's alive, but we can do a lot better than that. That shouldn't be our baseline is, okay, your baby survived this traumatic experience. The experience wasn't meant to be traumatic. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And you know, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of women doing exactly what they want to do um, when they want to do it. And I fully support women in choosing whatever birth path they choose. But we're not generally given truthful information with which to actually make an informed choice, right? And what we often see after industrial birth is you know, women who are not just instinct injured, but physically injured. And, um, you know, often, most often, I think, not always, but often, those injuries really have nothing to do with the underlying process of birth, but they're you know, really inflicted as part of this industrial birth experience. Um, and 
you know, it's designed specifically to sabotage birth and then to kind of hero the woman out of a danger that was, you know, manufactured by the very system yeah. that's now positioning itself as the savior, right? Um, so, you know, as a culture, we've been led to believe that this is a problem of nature, you know, but I, for me, it's, it's the other way around. Um, nature is the solution. Um, it's my solution. You know, I think for other people, technology and drugs are the solution. Um, um, and for them, I guess, dependency on pharmaceutical companies and drug medication and, and that whole apparatus, um, it's not a problem. But, but it, it is a problem for me. I think it's, it's certainly very subjective. Um, but no, I think our bodies are, are capable and, and we're designed to just enjoy the process of life. Like what I, what I really have found, especially during my last, um, my most recent birth was just this immense curiosity about the whole process. Like, wow, it's just so amazing that, that we get to do this. And, um, you know, I said before that I, I don't always trust the process and I don't even always want to surrender. And I, you know, feel all the same feelings that, that so many women do, but, I think that we're in this wonderful position now where actually learning about how birth works and having an understanding of the physiology of birth can kind of give us an opening to um, just being willing to have the experience. So we all have been really um, indoctrinated, I think, um, and it can feel really scary to, uh, I think a lot of people interpret, you know, not choosing natural birth or free birth or, or stepping outside of the system as, you know, taking an enormous risk. But when you learn about how birth works, you start to see these processes and procedures in the system very, very differently. And I think the, the risk of, um, of losing what the, just the incredible riches that, that nature offers us, you know, when it comes to, to what the birth process can do and, you know, that spiritual awakening that the birth process can, can give us, um, you know, that, that, that ends up feeling like maybe more of a risk. Um, and it's not all just, um, you know, the spiritual aspect. Too. I mean, that's a huge aspect of it for me, but just in terms of actual physical safety, like I've truly come to the perspective now in my life after having all these babies and witnessing so many births and being in birth that, you know, quite objectively, I feel much, much safer at home. You know, it's not just that I know that I'm going to be able to experience this, um, you know, uh, soul awakening that, that birth does, but also that I'm very, very confident that my baby is going to be safer being born in the, the peace and sanctity of my home than, than in the hospital, where, again, so many of what, uh, so many of the procedures that they undertake and, um, you know, the strategies that they have are truly counterproductive and very, very frighteningly dangerous when you really look at um, how birth works and the evidence that proves so many of these approaches to be dangerous. I want to have you go into a little bit more some of these arbitrary impositions like your baby's position and the due date where women can feel like they are if they're not adhering to these very strict kind of guidelines that they are potentially putting themselves or their child at risk. And what's your perspective on that? Yeah. So the due date thing is huge. And, you know, I'm a mother who tends to give birth to her babies at, um, you know, after around 43 weeks of pregnancy, which is <gasps> shocking, right? Um, because a pregnancy is 40 weeks. Um, and after that, you're overdue. Uh, and it's such an unfortunate way of seeing things. And I think really that it's a pretext for uh, enacting um, industrial birth on women. Um, I think that is really the purpose of the whole due date racket. Um, it's based on, in particular, one very flawed study, I think from the 80s or 90s, um, uh, but it's just the perfect um, kind of, uh, it's the perfect fear factor, right? Like if women are told that, well, if you uh, don't get that baby out, your baby's going to die, 
um, who's going to question that? It would mm-hmm. be crazy to, to question that. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just, it's really, really important for the continued sort of functioning of the industrial obstetric system to ensure that um, the way that the system is set up is, is perpetuated. It, it, you know, if, if women had smooth and, and peaceful births um, when their babies decide to be born, then you know, obstetricians wouldn't have a heck of a lot to do. So I, I think that's really what it comes down to for the most part. Um, and it is really, really scary. It's scary to uh, let go of those structures that are seen in our culture and our society as normal. Um, and even for me, you know, after having had all these babies, you know, during my last pregnancy that progressed until 43 weeks, by the end of it, I was, um, yeah, I was, I was uh, anxious, definitely anxious. Um, but again, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the plan. Um, that sense of, you know, heightened awareness and, uh, and even anxiety and you know I was prowling around my home like the sort of wild animal just hissing at everybody <laughs> and, um, uh, and you know that's that's part of it, it it's part of the experience and, and it's part of the spiritual experience too because we are programmed like the mammals that we are to get to a certain point of our pregnancies and to be desperate to meet our babies you know desperate to encounter our babies, and um, and I mean, I I just know I I, I know that uh, women are not machines. Like there there is no special day. Like there's there's no arbitrary date. At, at, you know that 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 we that we need to be imposing on this process. It just doesn't it doesn't make sense that our bodies would be healthy and vital enough to. Um, to become pregnant in the first place and then to grow these babies to a certain point. And then, you know, if the baby's not out by Tuesday, like everyone's just going to, you know, collapse and, and, and break, you know, that, yeah, that just doesn't them. make sense. Like our, our, our menstrual cycles are not um, by the book, you know, by the calendar on the clock um, and neither is birth. We're, we're human beings. I mean, it's just such a, it's such a collective madness, really, that that uh, has kind of overtaken this culture, um, and it's uh, I, I don't know. It's just it's nuts. <laughs> no, I agree fully. So let's end off with you talking about more of this as a spiritual awakening for you, as I've talked about and you've alluded to, like, what do you feel after eight babies? Like, how has that transformed you and brought you into yourself? How would you describe how you've changed as being a woman who's home birthed and free birthed? So that means you haven't had outside assistance apart from your family being in your space. And what is, what do you feel like that's done for you? It's just the most euphoric and gorgeous experience I can, I can describe. Um, the love I feel for my children is beyond, and I think every mother does feel that for their children, no matter what kind of birth she has. But um, I felt really in touch with, uh, with just the pulse of, of, of the world and, and, and an expression of, of aliveness that that's beyond anything else I've, I've ever experienced. And, you know, I went through a period um, uh, between babies, I should say, where, you know, I did every drug under the sun and um, you know, that was its own, its own trip. But there's nothing else like birth that can offer such a, uh, a profoundly kind of connected sense. And, you know, I, I have real confidence as a mother, and that comes from my birth experiences without a doubt. Um, I just don't even know who I would be without the kind of births that I've had. Um, and, yeah, uh, birth is, it, it, it really is ecstatic in the most profound sense. Um, 
Yeah. Fabulous. It's a very hard question. Yeah, it's a, it's I can see you going thing. inside because I'm sure it's not something to describe so much with your left brain and your intellect because it's something that you've experienced viscerally and it's transformed you on a cellular level. So you just rebirth into a new version. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love to be able to share my birth experiences with, especially my daughters, my, my sons as well. I mean, they're all part of my family and my, my kids are always with me when I, when I give birth or kind of around or in the vicinity. And I think as an extension of that spiritual experience to be able to see my daughters um, know birth and understand birth and love birth and, and to, you know, have no question in their, their minds that they will grow up and, you know, possibly give Birth in, in such power as well is, is pretty, pretty magical. And, you know, I mean, this is kind of part of the spiritual aspect too, but, um, you know, when you start to kind of understand how powerful birth is and the fact that we all, all women have that power within us, we all have the capacity to, to birth, um, you know, birth our babies and, and in doing so birth ourselves, um, you know, all of these other kind of societal structures start to sort of fall away and we become kind of compelled to, you know, question all of this other stuff as well. And I think that might be one of the reasons why, you know, the free birth movement and this sort of autonomous birth movement uh, is so uh, confronting for people because uh, it's really scary to be in this position of like, wow, so none of that stuff is necessary. <laughs> and you know, I think there's a sense of, um, you know, power, but also maybe um, a little bit for, 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 for a lot of women, a little bit of isolation because um, it's, it's, it's intimidating to, to find yourself kind of stepping into your power in that way and, and to be sort of forced to question all of these other structures. Um, but... Uh, yeah, birth is just everything. And, and birth is definitely such a profound spiritual experience, but it also incorporates sort of every other, every other emotion that's possible as a human being. So it's just everything all at once. It's, it's a spiritual journey. You know, it's hilarious. It's fun. It's ridiculous. It's terrifying. I mean, it involves so much darkness as well. And that can be challenging. Um, but it really encompasses all... Of life and I just love it I just love her so much <laughs> well you I'm keep so doing grateful. it so you clearly do I'm that. so grateful to be a woman I keep doing it I know I know I'm gonna have to stop at some point but you know being in the world of authentic midwifery really really helps and uh yeah it's uh it's amazing our bodies are amazing well, I love what you said is that having as well this far reaching impact into, I'd say busting illusions, right? Like you come into this sense of truth and your own power and your own abilities. And that translates into the rest of your life where you have, I'd say a more clear lens to be able to pierce through illusion and understand what you can do. You know, you've got such a strong sense. I mean, you just birthed a baby into the world. And so like the ultimate, act of expression and you know facilitation of this power and connection with the universe and once you know that and you know that that's within you you become unstoppable you know you have a certain exactly. kind of confidence and power about yourself that you can't get any other way that's so true and i wanted to say one more just quick thing that we didn't really go into kim but you know you are a sex therapist and your podcast is all about uh you know sexual ecstasy and, and sexual power and you know I I just want to put it out there to your listeners that I've had eight babies and my yoni just is so beautiful and it works so brilliantly and you know with several of my babies um, I had such you know wonderful straightforward births that you know I felt such an intimate connection with my husband and you know we made love the next day after one of my babies were born um and i think there's this idea that you know birth just wrecks our bodies you know and like your vagina is going to be uh just kind of a disaster um and that's definitely not the case uh, you know i think that the way that we give birth can well it certainly does have an impact on our sexual selves 
And I, I think for me anyway, that the way that I've chosen to give birth has, um, you know, brought so much richness to, um, the intimate relationship I have with my beloved. And, um, it's just been, uh, yeah, it's been fantastic. So, you know, we like to sort of decouple birth from sexuality, which is insane because <laughs> that's how babies get there. Um, but, you know, birth is a really profoundly sexual experience in a way as well. Um, there's a lot I could say about that. That's kind of a different topic. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, well, I'm so glad that you added that because it's so true that it's meant it's really been polarized in our culture and the whole orgasmic birth movement and even this idea of physiological birth really is suggesting then that having more intimacy, having sensuality through the birth process is going to help and ease the passage of the baby and make it a more pleasurable experience and really bring it into that realm of orgasmic. And I love that you shared that. Thank you for sharing that intimate detail that you made love with your partner the day after having a baby, because I'm sure most people's jaws just fell to the floor because you're right. There is, well, there, because there is this notion that birth wrecks your body and your vagina is going to be out of commission for a very long time. And yet in maybe a more optimal circumstance, that isn't the case. And that's not how things are meant to go. Yeah. I mean, there's such a variety, you know, I've, I've had all of the experiences. So, you know, I had a birth where, you know, I did need to, to wait. Um, and, and again, you know, women need to really be listening to their bodies and responding sure. to what is yes. true for them for sure. But, uh, no, in some cases, yeah, I, I, I felt so amazing after, after one of my births and, you know, my, my body was, was in integrity and, yeah, there was no reason not to. It was wonderful. <laughs> and have you used sensuality as a tool in your births? Has the, that been a natural part of your experience? Oh, my goodness, yeah. And that's one of the big differences, too, I think, between um, giving birth autonomously in our space as the sole authority of the experience versus being in an industrial, sterile environment surrounded by strangers and bright lights um it's just i mean it's very difficult to uh feel free and um i don't know if i would say that i've used sensuality in my births it's just an inevitability in the kinds of experiences mm. that i've had you know um and that goes back to um i don't we didn't really i didn't really get there yet but uh but positioning you know women are so terrified of you know, the position that their babies uh, happen to be in, um, you know, after an ultrasound or what have you. And I think that this whole, um, uh, this entire kind of idea of positioning being so, you know, like scary and, oh my goodness, you know, is my baby posterior, oh dear, oh dear, um, that has arisen as a result of the fact that when we go into the hospital, we are either, you know, told what to position, you know, told how to lie or where to be, or we're, you know, debilitated by an epidural, or, or we're just in such a foreign um, atmosphere that, you know, we feel really um, uh, inhibited. Um, because I think that if women were generally giving birth in their homes um, with that feeling of freedom and authority, you know, if you under again, if you if you understand birth, if you see women giving birth um, in the wild or in the relative wild, their homes, women are just inevitably sensual. We are inevitably, you know, changing position constantly, dancing through our sensations. You know, undulating our hips. Um, you know, up and down, and hands and knees, and jumping around and dancing. Like it just that is what birth is. So this idea of like, oh, well, can we kind of utilize different positions to, you know, help our babies themselves move into position? That wouldn't even be a discussion if we were giving birth um, spontaneously, you know? I mean, it just, sensuality is part of birth. And I think, you know, what women have to do to survive industrial birth is to, not consciously, but 
but we're kind of forced to inhibit our sensuality in that kind of industrial atmosphere. So it's, uh, you know, that's another really unfortunate result, but birth is, oh my goodness, birth is so, birth is sensuality, you know, and, and it just, it's so, I feel so lucky and so privileged to be able to have had this experience of, um, you know, the, the, the creation of life just being this continuum, like, I'm with my beloved, we make love, we make a baby, I'm pregnant, I live my life, and it's lovely, and then I give birth, and I'm, you know, sensually connected to my infants in a similar way. It just flows, and, you know, life can just flow, and, you know, birth is this, you know, can be this portal to experiencing life as a kind of flow. And I think for me, having as many children as I have, um, you know, sure, I'm, I'm in the world, you know, I have to pay bills and life can get chaotic. But, you know, I think I feel generally pretty in touch with that flow as a mother as well. And, you know, it all kind of comes from um, our birth is the origin. You know, women are the beginning. We make life. And, and uh, you know, I talk about this a lot, but um, I think we give birth in a way that kind of expresses the totality of our lives. And the way we give birth, again, just has this impact on everything that we're about. And culturally, the way a culture does birth really speaks to that culture's values. And, um, and I want to give birth as an expression of who I am. Who I really am, and that's the other really cool thing about birth too. Like I've seen all the, I've witnessed so many women give birth, and you know the structure of physiological spontaneous birth is is very similar. You know we've got this sort of general stages, and you know women start off, and you know it's kind of like oh, kind of you know exciting, um, you know sweet sensations, and then we move into the you know the harder work of the baby moving down, and then. Um, you know, and then we're like kind of screaming and raging or, or some women don't, but, um, but it's sort of a general you know, thing. And then the baby emerges. Um, so the, the, the overarching physiology of birth is, is it's so very similar across women, across cultures, across species when it comes to, to mammals in terms of, of physiology, different in the hospital because it's, it's because of all the mediations we already talked about. But in terms of individual women, when we are fully supported in our power, when we are uh, uh, given the, um, uh, you know, the respect of our own authority, when we are in the privacy, the safety of our homes, birth is an expression of like our deepest, truest, most beautiful personalities. Um, and we just give birth exactly who we are. Um, and it's so amazing to to see that in myself um you know to see my like my my own courage and my own um you know self-expressiveness and you know how funny and charming and wonderful I am like I just birth in our power makes us fall in love with ourselves and um and I think that it's much harder to experience that um in an industrial setting that's so beautiful. I love that, that it's this opportunity to fall deeper in love with yourself. Well, thank you so much for all of your sharing and your wisdom. It's been wonderful to have you. Thank you so much, Kim. The Sexy Mama Salon is now open for registration. This is my eight-week online program in all things holistic pregnancy and birth. This is the real education we all ought to have received and a complete overhaul to everything you thought you knew about what pregnancy and birth was supposed to look like. We cover the full spectrum from preconception, conception, pregnancy, birth, and the early parenting years. You don't have to be pregnant to take this course. This information and techniques are applicable as excellent preparation for you and your intimate relationship, both with yourself and your partner, from sexual, emotional, energetic, and physical perspectives. Natural, easy, orgasmic pregnancy and birth are totally possible, and I will show you how. You can find the Sexy Mama Salon on kimonami.com slash sexy dash mama. 
Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe and also leave a review and send someone else the gift of a healthy libido and an off the charts love life by sharing this episode with them. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, many happy orgasms.